Our next speaker is an accomplished business executive and public servant. Dan Doktoroff is CEO and president of Bloomberg LP. He led the company through the financial crisis by pursuing an ambitious investment strategy which included major enhancements to its products, services, and technology, starting up new businesses and acquisitions such as business, Bloomberg Business Week. Under Dan's leadership, Bloomberg's presence in this town has grown exponentially. Prior to coming to Bloomberg, Dan was deputy mayor for economic development and rebuilding for the city of New York. Along with Mayor Bloomberg, Dan led one of the city's most dramatic economic resurgences, spearheading the effort to rever reverse New York's fiscal crisis after the attacks of 9-11 through a five-borough economic development strategy. This plan included the most ambitious land use transformation in the city's modern history, the largest affordable housing program ever launched by an American city, the formation of new central business districts and industrial business zones, and the creation of new destinations like the Harbor District, designed to link together new parkland and miles of waterfront esplanades in Lower Manhattan, Governor's Island, and Brooklyn. Dan also led the creation of Plan YC, a 127-point plan, okay, that's a big plan, <laughs> designed to create the first environmentally sustainable 21st century city. The plan sets the course for a 30% reduction in global warming emissions by 2030. Before his work in the public sector, Dan was managing partner of Oak Hill Capital Partners, a major private equity investment firm. You know, you've heard me say at Human Rights First, we aim to foster American leadership on human rights. And when we say American leadership, we don't just mean the U.S. government, but also American companies, companies like Bloomberg. As, as a leader on human rights, we, as a member of our board of directors, Dan has been instrumental in Human Rights First transformation and growth. His personal and professional commitment to American global leadership is exemplary, and we are so pleased to have him with us today. He's going to give a few remarks, and then we're going to sit down and have a conversation. Please join me in welcoming our board member and the president and CEO of Bloomberg, Dan Doktoroff. Thank you so much, Elisa. It is great to be here. Um, it was a very kind introduction, uh, but more importantly, Thank you so much for your friendship uh, and your leadership at Human Rights First. You know, there's virtually nothing that I wouldn't do for Human Rights First. But if Elisa had been really honest, um, she would have said that I really only have one special talent as a board member. Every time we hold the annual fundraising gala, <laughs> I'm the guy who, after dinner, has to get up and lead the text to pledge. So we're on your phone. You can text to give money to Human Rights First. You can do that now, Dan. Well, in fact, I was just going to say, let's lock the doors. You're going to see up here on the screen the number. I'm kidding, sort of. Um, but uh, for those of you who aren't actively engaged in Human Rights First, I I'm actually going to come back to why I believe so passionately and about Human Rights First and why I think it's such a critical organization, particularly at this moment in time. Now, what, what do I mean when I say at this moment in time? I think we would all recognize that we are living in an age of far greater complexity in the fight for human rights, with greater interconnectedness between nations, regions, and economies, and more powerful tools on both sides of the fight, from the promise of social media and smartphones to the specter of government spying and hacking. What do most of today's fights over human rights have in common? At their core, they are fights over information. Now let me tell you just a little bit about Bloomberg. Um, Bloomberg was founded three decades ago, actually as a company that was founded based on a belief. A belief that transparency itself is a social good. In financial markets, 
information, knowledge is everything. And what we do is we provide really the, the necessary information for people who participate in financial markets to make them their most important decision. But at the end of the day, the belief was, was that transparency breeds confidence. Confidence catalyzes investment. And investment creates opportunity and ultimately a better standard of living. The exact same thing is true in global politics. Just look at some of the biggest gains in human rights we've seen in recent years. The Arab Spring grew at least in part from protesters who used Twitter and Facebook to get around state-operated media outlets, spreading information, mobilizing protest, ultimately forcing rulers from power in Egypt, Tunisia, Libya, and Yemen, and sparking massive uprisings in other Arab nations. In Pakistan, a young girl wrote a blog about the realities of attending school under Taliban rule and kept telling her story to the world in spite of being shot in the head and neck for speaking out on behalf of education for women, bringing the issue to the world's attention. In Syria, an unemployed blogger who researched and pieced together YouTube footage of weapons and information about the Civil War helped lead to the discovery and destruction of the country's poison gas arsenal. And here in the US, Google and the Polaris Project launched a human, the global human trafficking hotline network driven by data to consolidate anti-trafficking hotlines and connect victims to resources on a global scale. And just this past weekend, Tom Friedman wrote about the other Arab Spring happening now, in which Arab rulers are embracing, if not democracy, then at least a new era of accountability and an openness to technology. All of these stories prove the same thing. Information, ultimately, is the oxygen of human rights. The problem is, of course, is that we are not the only ones who have come to that realization. As much as we'd like to think that technology is creating a steady drumbeat of progress on the issues that we care about, in some ways, we have to recognize the opposite is also true. Because the more success that individuals and movements are having utilizing the tools of communication, the harder oppressive governments are pushing back against their use. This is particularly evident in wide, the widespread efforts to suppress the media. Over the past three decades in particular, we've seen the rise of violent extremist groups who pay little heed to the global rules of the road. They ignore notions of medical neutrality, disrespect the humanitarian mission of the Red Cross, and see journalists as a prime target to make a political statement. From my perspective, this rising threat to a free press is perhaps the most troubling development of all. Despite examples of progress I mentioned, we're actually seeing record numbers of journalists who are imprisoned, attacked, and murdered. And violence is by far from the only risk. Fearing an informed, enlightened, and connected populace, governments are turning to censorship and intimidation to suppress the truth. Last week, at the annual benefit of the Committee to Protect Journalists, we honored four journalists whose stories shed light on the scope of the problems we're facing. They included a reporter who's been branded a terrorist because his country's laws don't distinguish between covering terrorism and aiding it. An anchor whose government breaks into her broadcast with impunity to tell its own skewed version of the news. A satirist who was arrested on charges of 
insulting the president because he exposed the hypocrisy of extremism on the left and on the right. And a blogger who sits in jail right now serving a 12-year sentence because he dared to create an alternative to state-run propaganda. Now, these may seem like extreme examples, but they're growing more prevalent. Now, fortunately, our reporters at Bloomberg rarely find themselves facing these kinds of extreme risks and danger. Even so, like all news organizations, we find ourselves facing enormously complex challenges in our dealings with countries and regions that don't have the same respect for free press or history or the history of human rights that we demand. Now, some of you may know that we've been in the news recently about our coverage of China. To understand the complexity of this issue, I should explain a little bit about the history of Bloomberg News. While there are other media organizations that cover the same regions and issues we do, I'd argue that there's never actually been a company like ours. We were founded, after all, not as a news company, but as a company to serve a very specific set of users who purchase subscriptions to our Bloomberg terminals. Traditional outlets like the New York Times seek to reach as wide an audience as possible. The revenue they earn from subscriptions and advertising to readers is their primary source of income. Our news organization was really conceived of to add greater value to our existing customer base and to help attract new customers. So the philosophy started out much different. Having said that, Mike Bloomberg acknowledged the potential of the complexity between the relationship of the news organization and the business operations of the company from the very beginning. When he interviewed 24 years ago Matt Winkler to be the editor-in-chief, Matt asked him a hypothetical. What would you do if I came to you with a story that was critical of our clients, our clients who pay you a lot of money, and you knew that running it would risk losing, would in fact would lose the company business? Mike said without hesitation that he would run the story. And that is the philosophy that we have always lived by. But we also have to acknowledge that things are complex. And they've gotten more complex for us over the years. By pairing an ambitious news team with our core business, in some ways Mike set in motion two trains on a very long-term collision course. So we said, we've never wavered from the commitment to run stories if they are journalistically sound and relevant to our clients, even if they risk relationships on the business side. But over the past two decades, our news organization has grown from a tiny part of our business to one of the world's most influential news providers, with a, a significant footprint among consumers beyond our terminal subscribers. And among those 318,000 plus paying clients, news offerings have never been as important or embedded in their daily workflow. The reason we were so outraged about the recent coverage over China is that it called into question our integrity by suggesting we decline to run a story in order to protect our terminal business. I'd like to think our record speaks for itself. We face this business versus journalism conundrum time and again, and we've always sided with journalistic integrity. But that is not to say that this issue is simple or straightforward. As we navigate the right approach to take in China and other challenging markets, 
And I'm not just talking about that one story, but in general, we must constantly ask ourselves a set of really difficult questions. Like, how do we shield reporters who live in troubled regions from the possible consequences of stories written by their colleagues who don't live there? How do we reconcile the need to maintain a presence in a country in order to keep reporting essential stories and stay true to the integrity of our news mission? Must we have the same standard everywhere, given the variance in risk from place to place? And how much more difficult are these questions in a world when hacking of computer systems is something we should all be worried about. These are tremendously complicated questions, in many ways unprecedented. And more broadly, the questions we face today aren't nearly as black and white as we'd like them to be. The reality is, for Bloomberg, for our news organization, we live in a world of gray. The world is now more gray than it ever has been. Now that leads me back to human rights first. Because the issues that companies like ours face today have no obvious answers. And we must figure out where to go for advice and outside perspective. The reason I believe so much in human rights, in human rights mission as a beacon to ensure the continuance of American ideals, is because of the way Human Rights First addresses problems. Human Rights First understands, as it did a couple decades ago with the Fair Labor Association, which brought together companies to tackle the issue of sweatshops, not by just naming and shaming, but by bringing people together to understand the facts and work on practical solutions that recognize that the world is often gray. Just as Human Rights First did a couple of years ago by bringing together a group of generals to confront the issue of torture, just as it does with almost every issue. We need places in the world. We need conveners. We need thought leaders. We need analysts who actually understand that we live in a complex world. And that is why I am so proud to be a part of Human Rights First. It's not just about fundraising. It is about ensuring that we as Americans do act as a beacon. We as a company hope to do that. We need help, and we need help from organizations like Human Rights First. Thank you very much, and I look forward to talking with Elisa. That was great, Dan. Thank you so much, um, both for the advertisement. <laughs> and do it when you can, you know? <laughs> I appreciate that. We love that in a board member. I also just wanted to uh, recognize Robbie Karp, who's also uh, on the board of Human Rights First, who was there at the birth of the Fair Labor Association and did so much to help make it happen. Thanks for being here, Robbie. Um, so you, you talked a lot, Dan, about the, the challenges and responsibilities of a media company um, and what the kinds of issues that Bloomberg place, uh, faces globally. But putting aside um, your news organization, Bloomberg is also just a big global company. Um, how do you see the role of, of American companies in general on human rights? What can they be doing? What should they be doing when we talk about American leadership? Um, you know, in many respects, the brand of the United States is American companies abroad. A, a lot of places in the world understand the United, the United States mostly through the operation of global companies. 
what do you think is the responsibility of, of American companies, and how would you define corporate citizenship? Um, well, obviously it depends on what the company does. But you know, what, what I really believe is that companies have a global responsibility. And the global responsibility is, to, on the one hand, to act in such a way that their operations actually advance the ideals that America represents. And there's many different ways to do that. You know, we talked about, I talked a little bit about Google um, and what Google does. And it's done it in many different ways. You know, you go back to um, the Fair La Labor Association with companies like Nike and Phillips Van Heusen did in terms of actually recognizing that they were part of a problem. People criticize Walmart for lots of different things. Walmart if you look at sustainability, for example, may be the leading corporation in the world in terms of creating supply chain um, discipline focused on sustainability issues. At Bloomberg, what can we do? You know, we're an information company. As I said, information creates transparency, which ultimately, I believe, is a social good on multiple levels. You know, for example, one of the things that we're doing is we help to create a not-for-profit that is creating a set of standards by industry of, by, for um, social governance and environmental metrics that hopefully over time will be used by every investor in the world as a way of evaluating companies and holding them accountable. In that case, and that's a philanthropic thing for us, and it's a business thing for us, Leveraging the skills that we actually have, again, to ensure that the ideals that we believe in actually get promoted and, more importantly, have a difference. So that every company on some level when they, when they uh, operate globally or, by the way, just at home, um, if they're creative enough, can find ways that they can contribute. On that, that last point about the, um, I mean, the role, one of the unique things about Bloomberg is that you know, Bloomberg's data and analytics and, and news hits the desks of the most influential people in finance um, and investing in this country and around the world. H how should social indicators and human rights issues be factored in somehow into those decisions in terms of, you know, where people ought to be investing? We, we can't dictate, certainly we can't dictate how people should make decisions. What we can do is give them the information that they need in order to be able to make smarter decisions. And I actually do believe that those social indicators, or as I mentioned, governance, environmental, you know, potentially labor, pra labor practices, which I view as sort of part of the social component of it, absolutely should. And that's why we actually did create this or helped to create this organization. But the one thing you know is if the data is no good, nobody's going to use it. And so this is a painstaking process of literally going industry by industry by industry, convening, just like Human Rights First does, you know, the companies in the industry, consultants, accounting firms, and the like to determine what the right measures really are by industry. Because if all you're going to do is slap a general set of metrics on the entire world, you're going to fail. And there are no simple answers. So it is a very, very complex, painstaking process that will take us several years. But I actually believe that once that information is respected, and investors actually start to focus on it. And by the way, increasingly investors are focusing on these things. They're just frustrated because they don't have the good information. But once that starts to happen, there may be no better way of holding corporations accountable than this. That, that would be a huge step forward, I think. Um, speaking of complex problems, Bloomberg News ran an investigative piece uh, over the summer outlining how every Bangladeshi factory could be brought up to adequate safety standards for the equivalent of about 90 cents per pair of jeans. Um, but the factory owner pushing for reforms talks about the difficulty of convincing companies to pay extra in a commodity market where every 
single cent uh, makes a difference. How do we solve a problem like that? You've you got to bring people together and solve it as an industry-wide problem. If one person, one company taking action um, is only going to, unless they're huge, um, but certainly one producer at the, you know, at the very end of this supply chain, they're just going to hurt themselves and they're not going to do it. That's why I mentioned Walmart before. I mean, Walmart's a great example. You know, Walmart is the largest buyer of apparel in the world. Walmart is now, and I'm not shilling for Walmart. I think there's lots of things Walmart does that could be done differently. But in this regard, you know, they've actually brought together other companies in the industry. They've certainly participated with a, its collective action at the point of greatest leverage that ultimately makes a difference. Um, so unless there's that one actor who has enormous power, which tends not to happen in the world very often, you've got to bring people together. Again, a reason and a role that Human Rights First um, could play. Well, you've been a, a terrific um, spokesperson for, for Human Rights First, um, and you're a, re a repeat board member. You were on the board, then went off into, into uh, the Bloomberg administration, and then uh, came back. But, um, but I remember that you were a very vocal proponent of our name change, our rebranding, if you will, um, from the Lawyers Committee for Human Rights, which was our founding, um, a founding name uh, more, 35 years ago, to Human Rights First. What was behind that? Why did you? Because it was name changes are horrific exercises. But this was not a pleasant process, <laughs> let me tell you. You know, I think there were really two things behind it in my mind. There were many others that, that drove the decision, um, and I was only a part of a much broader, extensive conversation. Um, one, I felt that, you know, look, at the end of the day, for any not-for-profit, um, money is important. The more you raise, the more you can do. Um, the more you raise, the more good you can do. And I thought being the lawyers committee for human rights was too narrow and was restricting our ability ultimately to raise more money. And I think that has actually proven to be um, a good assessment, you know, the budget in the 10 years or so is, you know, approaching double what it was before we changed the name. That, again, that's not to say it was only the name change, enlightened leadership and, <laughs> you know, you know, it, you know appealing to donors based on the, the substance of, of what we do really matters. But I would say actually the other thing is that changing the name from Human Rights, uh, Lawyers Committee for Human Rights to Human Rights First also really freed us up to um, better define the mission. And I actually think this mission that I believe is so powerful about acting as a beacon and ensuring that America and American institutions live up to the, the, the ideals that we're so proud of um, would not have been possible if it was still Lawyers Committee for Human Rights. But Human Rights First um, actually gives us the ability to define that mission in a way that is, I believe, much more powerful. So for me, it was sort of those two things. You know, some might say we have less than impeccable timing uh, in terms of embracing this mission of American global leadership on human rights. Uh, there was a poll out uh, this week uh, that showed an unprecedented uh, number of Americans, 52%, think that the U.S. ought to mind its own business internationally. That's why, that's why we need us more now than ever. <laughs> so I think that proves the point, actually. You know, yeah. it's, it's, everything's easy when everyone agrees on something that, you know, seems obvious. It's where those things are being called into question that we need um, the support more. And that's a, a period that we actually are probably entering right now. Um, so... I think it actually is a raison d'etre right now. I, mean, I, I want to ask you, um, just to conclude, uh, New York City is going to go through a big transition. Um, and uh, less than a month from now, your, uh, your boss will return from a 12-year sabbatical. <laughs> uh, <laughs> how are things going to change uh, for you? And uh, I won't ask you how they're going to change for the city, but how will they change for Bloomberg, the company? 
God only knows. <laughs> I know Mike Bloomberg doesn't know. Um, look, I don't think it'll change a whole lot, to be perfectly honest. Um, you know, Mike has said very publicly he doesn't want to get involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the company. It's not like over the last 12 years he hasn't been informed, doesn't get involved in major strategic decisions, which he's permitted to do. He'll be around more. Um, he'll be an, an asset for us and kind of representing us uh, around the world. Um, and look, he's an incredibly um, smart, incisive guy who formed the company who uh, anybody would want to get uh, their advice and counsel. He also happens to own 87% of the company, so <laughs> you have to listen to him. But, um, you know, we've, we've enjoyed a terrific relationship over 12 years in two different um, incarnations, and uh, I'm looking forward to, to having a little bit more time with him. Well, it's, this has been such a pleasure. And as you know, I, I value uh, moments with you to get your advice and counsel um, in 20-minute power meetings over there in the crazy Bloomberg headquarters in New York. But this has been a real treat, Dan. Thank you so much for your leadership and for joining us today. And thank you.